Today we're talking to Kendra Houseman, who has a right from the start, from the moment she was born, she was involved as a child in uh, a family where the father was domestically abusive, violent towards her mum. And that went on for a long time. And she gives us a very interesting and disturbing account of what happened, what she saw, what she felt about it, all the different emotions that she had as a result of it. And she makes a, a very interesting interviewee and it was a, a delight to talk to her. And her story is quite extreme. Mm. But on the other hand, she has some experiences which we recognise from a wide range of cases that we've come across, either through your legal practice or through my um, psychiatric work, where families have rather felt that children weren't really aware of what was happening uh, between the parents, that they might think they were upstairs and not aware of the abuse going on downstairs. But uh, there was a general feeling that the people with the problem were the adults, who were either the victims or, or were having allegations made against them of domestic abuse. And I think Kendra's account um, gives a tremendous insight into what a child is aware of, what they notice, what they need and what they expect. So, Kendra, I was very interested in talking to you because I'd, I'd been listening to um, a podcast you'd done online and you were talking about your childhood experience and um, the difficulties as a child and what you felt in terms of domestic abuse. Um, and, and I wonder if you could tell us about what happened and how old you were, you know, you know that kind of thing, a little potted history of what you went through. So I think I was brought up in a, in a time when domestic abuse was the norm, like not the norm, but it was accepted in my society. I didn't really ever grow up thinking it was strange. Everyone's family has some sort of domestic abuse. <clears throat> but in terms of age, um, I was I was involved in DV from the womb because my dad most definitely um, was violent to my mum while, while she was pregnant with me. Um, in the blog, I don't know if it's a blog that, that you read or the podcast, but in a blog that I wrote about my dad, I talk about my birth and that my birth was um, quite traumatic for my mum because my mum and dad had lost a baby 10 years before me. Um, I don't know why, but they lost a baby. And so they'd waited a long time. So you, you and my dad had no other children. So you think that my birth would have been a massive thing. But when my mum went into labour, she was at home and she walked down. There was already concerns around the pregnancy and she walked down to the pub. A water's broke and she walked down to the pub to you know she didn't drive to get my dad to take her to the hospital and she stood at the door in her nighty or what a dress whatever sodden and sort of she called out to him to say i've gone into labor and he just went hey and like the crowd of men in the pubs and sort of grabbed him and went the baby's coming and engulfed him and she was just left at the door and so off she went and the next door neighbor drove her to the hospital and she was in labor for like three days it was really horrific for my mum like um they give her pethidine. She, she had bad anxiety. My mum, she had mental health. So she was not OK. Like this wasn't a woman giving birth and she was capable. She was not OK. And then my dad turned up um, three days later with a bunch of flowers and some charm and went to the nurse and said, I've come to see my son because he was only having a son. And that's how that's how bad it was for my mum. He already said to her that we're only having a son. There's no question about that. So he turned up to the hospital to say, I've come to see my son. And they said, actually, there's a problem. Your, your wife is in very, she's gone into a cesarean. Your, your, your wife's in trouble. And my dad tells, my dad picks up that story from that point and says how he got all robed up and they rushed him in and there was loads of blood. And, you know, he, he just stood there in like, whoa, what is going on? And I was born. And they put, um, they ushered him out. You're talking 1980. So he wasn't allowed. Men weren't. They were allowed, but they ushered him out because my mum then collapsed. My mum was um, lost a lot of blood. And then as he stood outside, they wheeled the baby off in the little, you know, incubators. I was massive. I weren't little, but they wheeled me off to the nursery because <clears throat> my mum was unwell. And so my dad said he had a choice. Does he go and check on his wife or does he come and see the baby? So off he goes. He decides that his son is the most important thing. And off he goes. And the nurse that is walking is talking to him the whole time. She's saying, you need to come with me. You should come and see the child. And he sits down. And my dad was massive. He was six foot seven, an Italian, big, deep Italian accent, like a scary man. And they sat him down, wrapped up the baby and give it to him and said, here's your daughter. 
And my dad said that he he felt shocked because he wanted a son. And so he looked down at this little girl and he said that I was so alert. My eyes were so open. I pulled my eyes open. And he said that even then you looked at me like you were disappointed in me. Did you say that? <laughs> drunk by a lot. Yeah, yeah. He said, you looked at you disappointed in me. And I always used to say to him every time we'd have this conversation a lot. And I would say I was from birth. I was disappointed in you. So he turned to the nurse. He tells his story. Where well, he told his story well. He would turn to the nurse and he said, "Look, look what this my beautiful daughter. You know, I my child. I'm going." And 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 the nurse said you, that we're not interested. Your wife's been in labour for three days. She's coming with a broken nose and a black eye. We're going to get social services involved. And so my dad had no concept that what he'd done to my mum was absolutely, she was there with black eye, broken nose, because he was there holding his baby. And he said to me in this conversation, but I made a promise. I promised that I'd never hit you. Did I? I never hit you, did I, Kendra? I was about, I don't know, I was about 22 at the time um, when we had this conversation. So usually when we get to that point of the conversation, he'd start crying and he'd leave, but he didn't this time. He looked at me so proud. He was like, but I never hit you, did I? Like, and I, I got up and I, I walked around to him and I put my hands on his shoulders, you know, because this was a big moment. This was his forgiveness of what he'd done to his mum. And I said, you never hit me, no, but you beat her bad enough for both of us. You continue to beat her. And for that, you're disgusting. And that kind of sums up where my dad's mentality was at, you know, in his head, he was his right to beat his wife, but he never beat his daughter. And therefore it wasn't that bad. Right. Did he did he beat your mother in front of you, or were you usually upstairs or somewhere else? Were you actually there? Yes, yes. So from that point onwards, if you said to me when did it start, would it it started from? Well, it never stopped. You know, I would have been experiencing that in the womb. So I haven't got. People always say that have I got big clear memories? No, I've got I've got a couple of really big ones, and I've got snippets. But the arguing was constant. My dad went in and out of prison a few times. So we'd have these gaps when I knew. So I had experiences of no DV. But when my dad went away, my mum would be quite ill for mental health. So there was no lull. There was always something going on. And when, he, right, so he would usually, he would go to prison. He would come out on home release. This is, how, this is when it, the memories are very clear. He would come out on a Thursday or Friday. And he's meant to come home for the weekend. But he wouldn't. He'd go to the pub. So he turned up Sunday. So I knew when them Sundays were. So he was meant to come home Friday. My mom would do cooking the dinner, all that. He's never coming. At five, I knew he wasn't coming. And then he'd turn up probably Sunday afternoon. So he'd been out drinking the whole time. He would turn up and I would be ushered off. I'd just go out. I would just be, I'd go and play because he would be drunk and all over me. Not in a horrible way, but he'd blow my bella, my bella. And so he would want to engulf me. But he's six foot he's six foot seven and I'm this little, you know, so my mum would be nervous and that's how the argument would start. Oh, I'll leave her alone. Don't pick her up like that. Don't throw her about. And then straight away, you can't tell me what to do with my daughter. And that's when the arguments would start. There were other times he would just come and start for no reason. The most prominent one, I was five, and he'd been trying to get into the flat. We lived in the flat, or a ground floor flat. He'd been trying to get in for hours. He'd been kicking the door, shouting out to her. And my mum used to take me in the bedroom. We'd have the bed against the wall and she would just play tapes that had stories on. It was just normal. I could hear him. And he'd call me. He'd say, let your daddy in. That he definitely would try and manipulate me. Sometimes I would. Sometimes I would. If she was asleep, I would go let him in and then he'd beat her. But anyway, this one time um, he got in. I don't know how he got in. Maybe she let him in, but I was in bed and he'd come in shouting and screaming. And so my mum put me in bed with her. I'm not saying for protection. But I was in bed with my mum. I, I used to sleep there quite a lot. And he started around her and he'd come in and he said, you will have this cup of tea. And he used to make tea with tea leaves. Like, I wouldn't yeah. tea leaves. And he chucked the cup of tea at my mum. I'm talking boiling hot. And she managed, so she sort of covered me. But I still got, I still was burnt. Not burnt, but it was still hot on me. But it burnt my mum. And I started screaming. And instantly my dad stopped and he backed out the house. Um, and that was my first time that I realised that he had control over what he was doing. Up to that point, I just thought that's what daddy done. Oh, I screamed and he stopped. That's weird. He left. The police got called. And when the police come, they treated it like nothing. You know, it was a domestic. So they just sort of took notes and left. So and that old, was my first realisation. How old do you think you were then? Five. 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 Right, right. So the, five. Po the police, what did they What did they say to him? What? What? You know, did they... Did they like tell I, him to, sorry? 
don't forget, I, w- I can't, I wouldn't remember. I, the con- no, I you're scared. only five. No, I'm, but I'm I can only... tell you what happens. They come yeah. in, they took my mum in one room, they took me in another room, they sat on my bed, on the bed, they checked me for injuries. I didn't, I'd had burns across, I had like a nightie on and I, it was red on my chest. They asked me if I was scared of my dad and I said no, because I weren't particularly scared of him. They didn't ask me if my mum, they didn't ask me certain questions. So they said, were you scared your dad? No. They asked me if I loved my dad. I always remember that and I had a little toy in my hand and I was thinking, in my head, I was like, no, but you can't say that about your dad. So I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, and I always remember being like that. And then they brought my mum in and she was crying and they just give her safety advice. So they said, don't let him in. <laughs> don't let him right. in. Yeah, um, don't let him in. How long have you been married? How long How how long has it been like this? And my mum just lied. It's the first time or it hasn't happened for ages. Or who knows what she said? And so she was, she was like, she was scared because if she, if my mum had got the police onto it in, in that period, it would have killed her. I absolutely know. My dad was involved in criminal activity. The last thing he needed or he would accept is the police coming and finding him, whatever he was doing, you know? So it was, it was so interweaved. My mum was involved and neither of them wanted the police there. She would call the police very rarely because we usually had stolen goods in our house. We didn't want, well, not we, but nobody wanted the police there, you know? Right. So there's a kind of a tradition of secrecy you know you 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 keep stum as it were you don't say very much the police are always the enemy is that is that yeah completely and I don't ever remember that being said to me I don't remember anyone sitting me down and saying that directly but it was very clear to me that I watched my mum lie for him Mm. like so I'd know what had happened I'd seen her take some big beatings some big beatings I didn't just see her lie to the police she would lie to the doctor and the doctor but I I also at a young age was very aware that they knew she was lying I can't explain how I knew that but the whole conversation was fake but I knew that but she lied to the school and so I I knew that you you, you knew what you had to do yes Yeah. yeah 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 I knew what I had to do I knew my role in that um, and my mum would always say, if he hit you, then we'll do something. And that was like the rule. If he ever hit you, if he ever done this to you, then you could say something. Um, but there wasn't just that. You're talking, I, was, I knew that I couldn't talk about the 20 TVs we had in our back bedroom or the stolen towels, these white towels from a, you know, from a hotel. I knew not to say about nothing. And, and, and so you weren't it. able to protect your mum at all by the sound of it? Did... Not when I was little, I wasn't. So... So what I learned was there was a really bad time. So I was a little bit older. Maybe I was only a year older, six. And um, he come in. I don't know what he was doing there, but he bought me. He deliberately was trying to distract me. So he bought me a puzzle and I'd wanted these trays that were soft underneath. And they sat on your lap. Oh, yeah. Know, I wanted, yeah. 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 I really wanted one. So he bought that home, but he was trying to get me to go into my bedroom. But it was cold. It was winter. So I wanted to sit. We only had one heater a Caligas heater, that's how old it is, in the front room. So I wanted to sit in there. And I think sometimes my mum didn't push me too hard to go away because it, it was very unlikely that, well, after that he did, it was unlikely he really beat her in front of me. It was very unlikely. I'm not, you know, when I think back. Okay. So I sat in the living room. It's a bit blurry, but there's it's lots of heat coming out of this fire. I'm really drowsy and I'm doing this, this puzzle. And they start arguing. Now, when I say arguing, my mum never argued back very rarely. But he is, I can't tell you what he is, but he's really angry. He's telling her, he's doing this saying, and they're behind. So the sofas were situated around the fire because it was so cold. And they're standing behind one of the sofas. So I'm looking at them. And he poked her in her chest. But my mum, so he was six foot seven, big. Imagine gym, gym yeah. muscles, gym yeah. muscles, big man, big, big man. She was at the time about, well, she in height, she was about five foot five, five foot six, um, eating disorder. She, I'd hear her making herself sick a lot. She, we didn't have money for food. So I, I at the time, I didn't realize that, but I, she'd always go about, she'd eat crackers and said that she liked that. She was gaunt. So her face was drawn. Cause I can remember at that time, she used to wear big glasses to hide the black eyes. She was tiny and he pushed her, like pushed her in her chest and she stumbled. And because he was so big and she was so little, and I remember her sort of disappearing behind the sofa, I'm sort of watching it, and he picks her up like a doll and stands her up and says, you know, don't mess about. And I'm, I don't think she's in danger. I just think that she fell over. So I watch, and then he just, not even punched her, he just sort of slapped her down like a rag doll. 
and she screamed and then I I didn't I, I thought I was screaming but I, apparently I wasn't I just looked and then all I can see is is a sofa and then imagine like an ape beating I can just hear and she stopped she stopped making noise and then I start screaming mum mum mummy 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 and he turns around I always remember it he turned around he was raging he was raging he had blood all over his hands and the he had a white shirt on. He was always very well dressed. And there was blood everywhere. And he raging. And I was saying, mommy, mommy. And he then sort of went very calm and said, oh, my baby. He picked me up, covered in blood. His blood all over his face. My, I know it's my mum's blood. I'm very aware of that. He picks me up and soothes me. He's now trying to, and he, he never harmed me so like physically. So he's trying to soothe me. He takes me into the bedroom and he sits on the bed and he's saying, what is wrong? What is wrong? I'm six, I can't verbal. I says, mummy's dead. No, 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 no. We had an argument. But no, no, no. So he, you know, he goes and makes me porridge. I always remember, he made me porridge. He says, eat this, it'll make you tired. I can hear her groaning in the other room. But I know that I can't go to her. I just know that. I know it's scary. I know maybe I'd seen something. I can't remember. I knew it was scary. And so then he calmed me down. He put my little lights on. And he's, you know, he's holding my hand. He leaves the room. I don't know what happens when he leaves the room. I'm covered in blood. I'm laying there in this, be- in this bedroom with these teddy bears in my bowl of poly with my mum's blood on me. And yeah, so that it was, people don't understand the impact of domestic abuse on that level. It's graphic. It's very real. It's very much out of control. So in terms of protecting her, no, no. And the next morning, if I tried to speak about that, she wouldn't, there'd be no conversation. It wasn't until I was older that I was able to step mm. in. So when people were having these fake conversations, when you look back at, the, you know, thinking of it as, as a child, would you have liked somebody to say to your mum, we don't believe you? Yeah. Yeah. And like, they may have, they may have, she was a good liar, but I can remember the doctor who was our family doctor, you know, he's the same person that when my mum passed away, he was the doctor for that, a family, long-term family doctor. He mm. knew. And he used to he, he used to try and press her sometimes. But don't forget, I wasn't I, I wasn't privy to everything. <clears throat> but no. sometimes I would go with her. And I remember this one conversation. He, he beat her quite bad, and uh, my mum had a bad back. Her back had gone. So up through the beating, she couldn't get up. So I had to let the doctor in. I had to let the doctor into the house. But we knew this. It was like a routine. So I'd have to go to the thing, look through it with Doctor Curran, and then I'd give him the key to let himself in. Anyway, I remember one day he come in and give her the cortisone injections in her back. She was covered in bruises. And he said, this can't, I always remember he said, this can't carry on or this. And he, she said, I, I've slipped. And I said, no, daddy was, daddy kicks the beanbag or something like that. And they both looked at me and he said, do you want to tell me something, Kendra? And my mum looked at me and I said, no. And what should have happened is social services should have been involved like that. But even when social services did become involved, I was very rarely spoken to, very rare. I was spoken at, I was told how to be, but nobody actually sat down and asked me. They'd ask me questions like, are you scared of your dad? No, I never have been. But that wasn't really the question. They never asked me if, I, if I'd seen my mum being harmed. They never asked me how she got bruises. They never asked me that. Hmm. When did things change for you? How old did you have to be before you started to feel... Um more independent or able to kind of make your own decisions about how things should be in the home yeah or just in your life really because it obviously your home life was under control was was dominated by the way your dad behaved but at some stage your home life you must have been able to behave as you wished at home so when i was seven six or seven he got a long sentence right gone i didn't know that i thought he'd gone to work and we still visit it it's weird but he got a long sentence. He committed quite a heinous crime. So he got a long sentence. So when I was seven, about six or seven, he went away until I turned 16. That's it. See you later. Um, So I initially went for contact. So he was working away. So we went to visit him. And I always remember them, the searches as a little kid. But my mum, my family, my mum told me that he worked in like a, uh, it's like a special thing for the government. So you have to be searched. Uh, and so I'd done that. And then when I hit nine, nine, I realised people, well, somebody said something to me and they said, oh, yeah, my dad's there. I always remember it. And I was like, what does your dad do? And he was like, my dad's in prison. And I was like, 
oh so I come home and ask if it if dad's in prison and my mum said yes and I asked what for she wouldn't tell me and so I went one last time stuff started happening outside of there so by the time I hit 10 I started visiting I didn't visit my dad again until I was 15 and a half well, I didn't see him again until I was 15 and a half so I become man of the house I'd say from the age of 10 onwards slowly but surely I become I control the house so what did that mean? Did you have to go out to work and earn the money or, or what it else? Started with different, it started different, well, it just started with all different <clears throat> things. There's so many layers to it. So my mum had really poor mental health. She used to regress. She would talk like a child. And she, my mum was very poorly, very, very poorly. Uh, when my mum was ill like that, the neighbours and stuff would ring and doctors would come or social, whoever would come. So when I hit 10, I realised that if the professionals didn't know then I actually could do what I wanted. So if my mum was unwell at 10, she didn't know, she, there was no rules. Because when my mum was well, there was lots of rules. Like she, was, she had very firm boundaries. But when she was ill, I could do what I wanted. And so I'd always been a carer. Nobody'd ever, ever recognised that and never have. But I was a young carer from a young age. So I just sort of become, I would become mum every now and then. So I'd come home, literally I'd come home, mom, my mum would be weird. And so I knew it could last a week, it could last seven months, and it did last seven months one time. I become mum. So as an example, when I was 10, when she'd become very unwell, we used to have a little cup with money. That was our, we didn't have a bank, we had money. And that cup was quite full. And so I would go and buy bits of shopping. But I didn't really know what, like we were living off cakes and stuff. My mum used to get benefits. Um, and in them days, the benefit book, you just, you went to the post, you went online, you went to the post office, yeah. you signed the slip and you got the money back. Yeah. yeah. So I, I signed the slips and done that for years. So I would sign a slip. I'd walk down there. I was 10 with a shopping trolley, you know, like the old lady shopping trolleys. I'd had that. I'd walk down. I would queue up once they ever asked me once. And I think I had a note. I think I'd got my mum to write a note, but the note said, can you please let my daughter, you know, I'd go and cash the money. I can't tell you. I think it was about 50 quid a week. I don't know. I'd get the money. I'd go and buy shopping, a 10-year-old shopping. So I made sure I had cat food and dog food. So that's why I had the shopping trolley and Coke. And then who knows what we have for dinner. But sometimes it would last a week. Anyway, once my mum realised that I could operate on them levels, she stopped going out. She had agoraphobia. So I'd have a note. I'd go up to the shops very often and buy lots of cigarettes. My mum smoked. So there'd be a note say, please give Kendra... 200 cigarettes this, 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 this. I kept her notes I kept her notes and so I would go and get fags and I'd go and sell them I can't tell you how that started or why I fought on them levels I'd get it on tick so my mum didn't have to pay at the sweet shop so we'd go and get it on tick so what I'd do is I'd get it twice go and make the money go and pay the man I was brought up in a criminal world it just seems second like nature then once did you go to school at that were you going to school at that time or, or just not going to school at all nobody did well, anything about you not going to school or did well, they well it's complicated so right I for one they probably didn't want me there I was horrible you know and I was a smelly kid I never had clean I was just I was just a problem for everyone and, and I clearly remember being treated as such so I was probably looked I mean social services records say how dirty I was or the, and the school reports say about it, but I don't remember it all. It wasn't always like that. My mum sometimes had me immaculate, but no. So when I was in school, I was always funny about food. I'd always want to go for seconds and stuff like that. And if I couldn't, I'd kick off. So up until nine, no violence. I was just a nice kid, but I was very quiet. Nine, something changes and I become really spiteful. So when I was 10-ish, so it's all at the same time, I had two really bad fights at school. I stabbed one boy in the mouth with a compass. That sounds really dramatic. That's not what happened. I chased him with a compass. It hit him in a toilet and it went into his mouth. But you can imagine that was big. But then I did have a really nasty fight where I really hurt someone. I was 10. And so they called my mum in. She never turned up for the meeting. I turned up to school the next morning and they said something about me being permanently excluded. But I didn't really understand that. And I didn't want to be there anyway. My attendance, if you look at the school report, was 48%. I just went when I wanted. I'd get up at, I had no alarm clock. So if I got up at 11 and wanted to go to school, I would go, you know. And by year five, so in year five, I got permanently excluded out of mainstream education to start a crew 
a, a pupil referral unit when I could reach year seven. So for a year, I was just lost in the system. And that was the worst year. So from mm. 10 to 11, year, four, year six, I had no, no, I didn't go to educate, I didn't go to school once. And did anyone do anything? No, they sent the social work around. I just climbed out the window, you know. No one had no control over me. I didn't go to school. And I've never been to, I've been to secondary school once for an hour and a half in my life. So this would have been about 1990, something like yes. that, when you were 10? 1990. Yeah, 1990 yeah. was the year. It's like the year I can pinpoint when, when it all changed. And so I wasn't in school. I was out in the local area. I was stealing. I was still anything, anything, anything I could. I'd sell it. And I guess the right people noticed that in me. And so people started talking to me. I was introduced. I always remember I was about 13, 13. No, maybe 13. And some of the older boys said, let's rob super drugs. Let's break into super drugs and nick all the medication. We didn't. We couldn't get in. But we broke into super drugs and just took stuff. So I went home. I always remember Charlie body spray. I had, I had hundreds. I'd have been zipped up. And um, then my mum, she went and sold them. Like, well, we had no money. So when my mum saw on the bed, she did. Uh, of course she did. She was like, what the hell? And then I just, whatever I said. And then she, she, I always remember she sold them because we were skint we had no money yeah mm. you what I mean, one of the things you obviously had to learn was how to keep your feelings to yourself because yeah it, it's a frightening environment and you had to make your own decisions about how you're going to cope with it and presumably that's affected you I mean like how do you keep yourself to yourself how do you keep your emotions kind of bottled in so that you don't give you're not vulnerable has that, has that happened? Yes. So there's only so many times you can watch your mum. I don't really care about my dad. And I don't know where that, I can't tell you when that happened, but I always feel like I didn't really, like he said, when I was born, I looked at him like I was disappointed. I, I just didn't, I just didn't like him. I don't, he passed away, you know, 13 years ago. I don't, I, didn't, I don't like him as a person. If he weren't my dad, I wouldn't have associated with him. I did like my mum. I love my mum very much. I liked a lot about her. There's only so many times you can watch your mum take a beating and her not stick up for herself or her take him back or whatever, that you have to do something so you don't lose respect for her. Like, that's the only way I can explain it. Like, I didn't, I, I, I don't know what age, but I made a conscious choice that I would almost be like a parent. I'd turn a blind eye to certain things because there's no way I could lose my respect for her. Because if I lost my respect for her, I knew that I would become disgusting. I, I, I just could I knew I'd become a drag addict or something I just knew that I needed to respect my mum and I wanted to respect my mum um she's got letters that she's written so and I read them when I've read them now I'm like wow so when I was about 11 I stopped saying good night I stopped kissing good night mm -mm. I'm not a baby I'm not a child because on the nights when she didn't do it when she was beaten or unwell I had to put myself to bed I had to do my own bedtime routine so I remember just one day, she and she would always say, good night, God bless. My mum's really religious. My mum and dad were both religious. So I said, I'm not, I'm not nah, I, ain't, I don't believe in God. And I always remember her face like, and I said, I'm not saying good night or God bless because there's no God. And she wrote a letter and said that she can remember this day. It's the same kind of time. So it was, it's still 1990. She said, I've lost my daughter. Um, she's writing a letter, I think, to her dad. Her dad passed away, but she was writing this letter. And it says, um, I don't, I don't know her anymore. Something just her eyes are dark. She's seen or heard something. She puts no concept to it. What she does say is she looks at her dad the same way. And so I just stopped. I cannot explain to you from 10 to 16, I stopped. I loved her, but she had to stay in a little box. She had to stay separate. I couldn't love her too much. I didn't touch her. Um, she wasn't allowed to touch me. I didn't hug her. And, and I've, I've read, she's written lots of letters and I had a lot of um, psychiatrists involved at the time because I made a clear, it's like I made a clear, boom, you, no one's touching me. No, I'm not being involved with no one. Uh, and I've just become pretty ruthless from that point because I did not care. I didn't care. And I still really feel really strongly about that now. Apart from, and this will hurt, you know, I know people are going to watch this. Apart from my three children, I really don't care. I know it sounds horrible and the job that I do, and I care about the kids that I work with, but on a emotional level, like my friends and stuff, I don't really care. 
And I've been to counselling for it four times. And the last time I went, I said, you know, I, I, I don't want to feel like I don't care. I want to feel like I care. They don't really know what to say. And I think that that's two things that happened. My childhood. And then when my mum died, my mum died in 2008, it literally hurt physically hurt my body i met them the person that was there said i howled like an animal as she, she died she died of cancer she died from me that pain i will never be able i cannot experience that again so a double wall went up i was already not up for it boom and a double wall went up and so now unless you're in this this circle here i don't really care about you i care about the kids that i'm protecting in my work because mm. they're almost detached it's almost as if, if I'm helping them because I know nobody can help them. But if you're an adult, I don't, I don't care about you. What do you think? I mean, more than what you're saying, Kendra, what do you think about society and the way that they treat children in the context of how you grew up? Do you, do you have a view of what you think of everyone else in terms of, you know, protection, lack of protection, you, you know, a parent, a parent, it seems as though not really caring very much about what happened to you um for me personally I was failed by the state I was failed by every single adult including my mum around me there's not one safe adult I don't end this story by going oh and then I met this person and they saved me that's not how it went there was no safe adult for me I I was I was disappointed and uh, every adult I turned to ended up wanting something from me on different levels on different levels and so I learned very quickly that actually for me uh, in my era and I do talk about this quite openly there wasn't really a professional that actually cared I get that I was probably a horrible kid to sit in front of you wouldn't you know after a few weeks some kids will start smiling and joking that won't happen doesn't even happen now I don't you know it's a lot of my reactions are fake and so I get it yeah I get it they couldn't they couldn't break me that I, there was not one professional that ever got a breakthrough. And I think they got frustrated and bored. So they'd send in, let's try this, let's try this. So I get I get in my circumstances, not I get, but in my circumstances, I weren't making adults feel good. So why would they be nice to me? Now, I mean, I, I don't get it. I don't get how the perpetrator of domestic abuse isn't also charged with child abuse if there's a child in the home. So what usually happens is, I'm just going to, it's not a man and woman every time, but just for argument's sake. You know, a stepdad and a mum and her kids, they're not his kids, he beats the woman. Social services will get involved and he will get charged criminally or not for that. But there's no, there's nothing. If he hasn't hit them kids, they've just witnessed um, emotional abuse. And even if he does put his hands on them, he just isn't held accountable in the way that he should be. And I think that any perpetrator of domestic abuse should be, when a child is present, should be charged with child abuse i don't understand why you wouldn't you know but but also don't you think it funny that i mean mainly people are very keen to say you know perpetrators particularly are very keen to say the child was upstairs yep you know couldn't couldn't have been affected and i think well that's insane isn't it because they hear stuff they're listening they're you know frightened and you know what's going on and you know what's going on and people are very um willing to accept oh well they weren't near but you know they were upstairs they they're not affected and i think that's another very odd idea but you do you hear, still hear that do you do you, do you, oh, do you think yes yeah. yeah absolutely um, from a child in domestic abuse, so I didn't see it all the time. You got to remember that I didn't see it every time, but I knew when it was coming. Mm. So that feeling I talked about on that Sundays, because remember, it didn't come every Sunday. My mum's actions made me know what time it was. Like she would act a certain way. And that stayed all the way through until I stopped him. And so she, I picked up very early and I am still, I can, I'm not usually wrong about people. I, you, I ignore the red flags i'm not saying i'm you know i'm, I'm rubbish but i know i do know because you pick up on stuff and so i learned from a very young age to be able to pick up on little tiny things what the way she done her hair that day maybe the music that she played the way she would move the uh glass ashtrays out of the living room because he would use them to beat her i know for a fact that kids that i've worked with 
would feel exactly the same way. They may not be able to vocalise that as a child, that, that might not come out of their mouths until they're 20, 30 years of age, but they know, they yeah. know. And even being upstairs, so I would be in my room and I'd hear the argument and shouting and bash. It wasn't just my dad, there was other perpetrators, he'd have parties, it was, it was horrendous. I knew what was happening, so I can remember clearly, I used to have a really rubbish, like a Walkman, and I do mean a Walkman with big fuzzy headphones and you put a tape in it, that was my life. Jungle music, I always say this, jungle music saved me because it was so loud and the beats were so heavy that I couldn't distinguish between my mum's head getting smacked off the wall and the drum and bass, you know, from the tune in my head. And so jungle become my, and then when I got a little bit older, I'd play it, you know, I'd play that music. And, and now, even now, it's my go-to music. It soothes me. And what, are the, and what are the things you've been deprived of because of this experience? Because you're saying you, you don't get that feeling of caring, um, except for, for your children. For yeah. You've, you've lost other stuff, I, I guess. I guess the biggest thing I've lost is my childhood. So mm. I had to grow up so quickly. I, and I say this, you know, I've been a mum since I was 16. But I was a mum before that. I've been caring and worrying and protecting other people since, since I was a baby on a very high level. Mm. And I'm not saying that people young carers and stuff like that destroys your life but it just didn't stop like I just didn't get to be a kid I didn't I don't remember I didn't go to secondary school I didn't have a prom I've never like I never had any of that because you know Uh, you're an intelligent girl you know you're an intelligent woman you could have used an education when I if I start thinking about what if so you know I was undiagnosed so I, I've got this I'm dyslexic and I've got ADHD my dyslexia was diagnosed when I was 21 my ADHD when I was about 25 but it wasn't like as good as it is now in diagnosis I'm 41 uh, what if that had been picked up in back in the day I would have had a lot more confidence I thought I was stupid because I couldn't read I could read I can read excellently but I couldn't write it and mm. so I avoided even putting myself in that situation. Mm. If so, if we if if we go back and you know, because my my children are clever, my mum was clever, my dad wasn't so much, but my mum academically was a genius. If I had gone to school and done what I wanted, I would have fulfilled my dreams. You know, I would have I would have put that that full process and that intelligence somewhere else. I didn't. Mm. What I did is I got bored. And when children and young people are bored, there's a few things that can happen. For me, bad stuff happens. Because I wanted to stretch my mind. I wanted, I had ideas, you know, but I'd go and use them in a criminal way. So when I realized that, like I'm saying, we had stolen TVs and videos in the house, I worked out a way how I could make money off that. Because that's the environment I was put in. If I had been brought up in a middle class household with food every day, who knows what I would have achieved? I don't know. Hmm. And then there must be other things to do with relationships that are a struggle. Or at least maybe just not in, not involved. You just yeah. I mean, so in terms of relationships, there's all, no one really gets beyond the barrier. Maybe a couple of people. There's mm. only I'd say there's two people in, in on this earth that know the real me, the real real me. Oh, two people, uh, and I think that it's made me. I'm quite hesitant. I don't believe nothing anyone's telling me. Like, as people talk to me, I'm reading their body language for a start. So they might be saying anything to me. And I'm reading, I'm, and I'm waiting to be disappointed. I'm waiting for you to disappoint me. And if I'm honest, nine times out of ten, adults do still now disappoint me. In little ways, I'm like, ah, oh, see, yep, I knew that. So, <sighs> But I, I wait for that disappointment, or do I seek it and make it happen? That's the conclusion I've come to now, because... I put conditions on relationships like we, once it's in my head, but once people do certain things, that's it. Um, anyone watching this will know this and will know exactly what I'm saying. I am cold. If I cut you off, I could cut you off tomorrow. There is zero chance, zero that I'll ever talk to you again. You can be my family. If I decide that you are causing me something, 
and I decide to cut you off, I could walk past, I could work with you. We could work in the same office. I could look at you and you are dead to me. <laughs> and a lot of people make that comment about my eyes. They say, I, I look at people like they're dead. They are. They are. And I've had to learn to do that. And I had to learn that to do that when I was very young with my dad. You know, that was my daddy because mm. I can remember saying the words daddy and he loved me. He bought me stuff. He said, carry me on his shoulders. He never shouted at me. My dad never in my life shouted at me. He never hit me. He never told me off. I could twist my dad around my little finger. One day when I was about four, I got him. I convinced him to put a tent up in our garden. We had a tiny garden. I convinced him to put a tent up. Come on, daddy, put the tent up. My mom was out. I don't know where she was. And then I convinced him to lay in the tent and he used to like, I used to tickle his hair and I knew that would make him go to sleep. And when he went to sleep, I got every single toy out of my house and I put it in my tent. And I decided that me and my dad would live in the tent with the toys. It still sounds genius. I still don't know why we wouldn't have it. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I loved my dad a mm. lot. Mm. There was a point. I can't tell you when it stopped. Maybe that beat him behind the sofa. But I idolized him and I looked quite like my dad. I cannot tell you when a cut off car happened, but I know that at one point I really loved him, adored him, not just loved him. I used to cry for him. And then something happened and I literally cannot even look at him. So that, which I can apply to my own father, I can easily apply to any other person. Yeah. In the yeah. Easily for fun. Yeah. So you've, you've, had, you've had various kinds of useless counselling and <laughs> psychiatrists and things. Uh, are you still are you still looking for any kind of help to change or or is that history now? kind of no no kind of so literally yesterday and it starts on Thursday I, I found a life coach somebody I heard speaking on a program I was like oh I, I like them that's more to do with my business because I can't keep going into business situations and being this way you, you have to be nice to people you have to uh, let certain things go and you have to be uh Hmm. Less things have to be less personal you know it doesn't have to be you either my friend or you're not and I recognize that and so I'm going to do some life coaching to help me recognize what my core values are because I think I know what my core values are but do I really know what they are but that's just for three weeks and we we'll see how it goes we'll see because I, I really struggle with having into I really struggle opening up about stuff that I obviously keep quite hidden. I've done a lot of work. I I'm going to call it inner child. I don't know what else to call it. So there was this voice. When things are going wrong, there's this voice that says, there's red flags here. Don't do that. And I've ignored that. That is my inner child telling me when things or whatever, telling me when things are dangerous. But because I was so angry at her, because I resented what she had been through, I ignored it. And so I lost that, that inner dialogue that people people that aren't brought up in abusive situations, that inner dialogue that goes, oh, that, is that okay? Mine got locked up because she's stupid because she let stupid things happen at the time of all that. And I had to lock that away. And it was only during lockdown when I had nowhere to hide that it come, that I had to face some demons. And that's when I'd done Blondie's People in a series of interviews, mm. 28 interviews with 28 people that could have saved me. It come out of nowhere. It started one interview. And then I thought, oh, I wonder if this person could have helped me. It was the best therapy. Every therapist I've been to or psycho, whatever, nothing touched them 28 interviews. Because you can see a journey of me going to this, you know, somebody and saying, do you think it's okay what happened to me? And them saying, no. And so I learned to forgive the child. I, I learned to forgive her for not stepping up and doing what, what I think she should have done, obviously. But, but so that's as, as an adult, you know, you're thinking yeah. as an adult. But you do it? have to forgive yourself. Yes, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. You do have to forgive yourself. I, I agree to that. But I think that when you're in it, when you sleep it, when I have nightmares about it, when when I, it's, it's easy to say that when you was in it, maybe I don't forgive, maybe I don't forgive society. Maybe I do, maybe I do forgive myself, but I will never understand how that man never went to prison for what he'd done. He went to prison. Yep, but not for what he did to to your mum. Never, no. never even got Nick. The police never even took him away. Not one time. Not, not one even time. took him away. Not even nope. took him out well, of the house. Away. Well, he'd run off when the police come. He's run okay. off and hide like round the right. corner. Like, but, but but obviously, like I could, I remember pointing one day and saying he's sitting in the pear tree. We had the pear tree at the end of our thing, and I remember saying my dad's in the pear tree and the police laughing. 
because my dad is like 20 foot tall and he's trying to hide behind this tree. Yes, it's comical. <clears throat> if I tell you that my mum's ear had been bitten off. Oh. Yeah, it's funny. We can laugh about it. But my mum was sitting in an ice pack. He bit part of her ear off. And I said, my dad's in the pear tree. And I was like, bloody hell. Because he was well known. As yeah. you can imagine, in the area, everyone knew who he was. Well, like, yeah. you know, look, look at Tone. Look at him hiding. So how dare you? Like, my mum, what are you doing? Yeah, my dad never got nicked. Well, he told me that. He'd brag about that. Not brag. That's the wrong word. But he 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 spoke. When we, as adults, when we had conversations, he would speak about the fact that he never got nicked for it. And the police what what did he make of that, though? What What do you think he made of that? What, what, was it that it was just what, what everybody did? Or, or you know, how, how did he make himself think it's OK? So... So, so I think up until I turned 16, he, honest to God, thought it didn't really matter. I promise you, like, me and yeah. him have had some very deep conversations. It, it didn't just get ignored. I don't ignore nothing, mate. I held him accountable. So um, the last time he ever put his hands on my mum, ever, was uh, I, I fell pregnant, very young. I was 15 when I fell pregnant. And my mum said, we can't tell your dad. We can't, we can't tell your dad because it's your dad. And he was due to, so he got his long sentence and he was due to be released around about the time I was going to have the baby. And so I went to visit him. I hadn't visited him since I was 10. So I got a VO and I went to visit him. And I always remember the letter he wrote me saying, oh, I can't believe, yes, I'm getting released. It's a new start. And I'm like, yeah, all right, mate. So I get to the, where we go to the visitation. And I always remember he was sitting at the table with somebody else, like not with him, but they sort of had a table mm. and he could only see the, the top half of me. He couldn't see the bottom half of me. And I sort of waved to him. Remember, I haven't spoke to him. And he's crying. As he sees me, he says, oh, there's my baby. And to east, the guards are around. And I, I remember it. And I just stood up. And I was massive. I'm not kidding you. I was hugely pregnant. And his face. And he just started screaming. And I laughed and I left. I was never going to see him. I just wanted to show him. Look. Look. Look what I've done. Look. I know you hate that. Anyway, so I go home. And I go into labour a week early. And I get taken to the hospital. I have the, I have the baby at home. But I get taken to the hospital afterwards. And about that evening, my, my dad got released on the day after my son was born, by pure coincidence. And so he goes back to our flat and the boy, the people in the area, they say, your daughter had the baby. She's at the hospital. My mum's my obviously at the hospital. So I'm in the hospital. I can hear him, right? I can hear him. I'm on the labour suite, hear him very proudly saying, uh, I've come to see my daughter and he says his surname, the baby's name is Marriott. I changed my surname when I was 11. I never took his name again. He don't know that. So he's there asking for a baby that they're like, no, he's not here. And I think that's hysterical. And I still think that's hysterical. Good, good. No child will carry your name because you're disgusting. Anyway, so they refuse him. My mum goes outside, calms him down. We go home three days later. I come home. So we're all living in the same flat. My dad's got his own place, but he's come back to, to live with us. Remember, I've not seen him since I was 10. Mm. Oh, I walk in. He's like loving it. He's come out of prison. Everyone's round. And I'm just like, what an idiot. Is there a cigar? I walk in with the baby. Um, and my dad was quite racist. And so he was convinced. Like he, he had said to my mum, I could hear him saying, if the baby's black, she's going to have to leave. And my mum said, she ain't leaving. The child is white. But I'm just saying is that that was his that was his attitude on it. He come over, turned. He said, he said, I don't even want to know the baby. He says to me, I, I do just anyway, I had the baby in the carrier in a pram. And he says, I'm going to look and then I leave. I said, do what you want, mate. No one cares. He turned it around. Uh, my son is looks like my dad a lot. And I, he turned the pram around and just cried yeah. and just cried his eyes out. Anyway, two days later, I'm obviously sorting out stuff and my mum baked some cakes and my dad ate them all he ate the whole lot so I come in and said you're greedy but why have you done that and he says eh, Nelly Nelly my mum you, you'll let your child speak to me like that and he got up and he went to supper a lot of changed let me tell you that a lot of changed since the day he walked out my house I, I was come from a different place now so I stepped between them and we were like forehead to forehead and uh I said maybe not as nice as this I said if you ever put your hands on my mum again, I'm going to have you killed. I had been involved with the police quite heavily at this point. So me saying that wasn't a joke. He says, what you, and I said, if you put your hands on my mum again, I'll have boys to come and take, and they will kill you. 
my mum started screaming. He, you know, nobody tells my dad nothing. And he sort of dropped his hand down. And I said, we do this. I said, this is how we're going to do this. Okay. I'm going to take the baby out. You're going to leave. You're not going to live here anymore. If she chooses to come and live in your house, that's up to her. We ain't living together. But if you touch her, I'm going to kill. I'll, I'll, I'll get you killed. I went out with the baby. I come back. He'd gone. He'd gone back to his flat. And my mum moved into down where she should have been because we shouldn't he needed to go live there and she wouldn't live there he never touched her again he never put his hand on her again and then we had conversations after that for a long time about why so from 16 my mum and dad had the best relationship I'm not kidding you she he treated her like a queen it's like he'd been given permission to not treat her poorly she, he treat uh they had they had 12 years 11 years until he died she they were in love but for the first time ever they went on holiday together and and I have to say this no matter when I'm talking about my dad my dad was the most outstanding grandfather I, I'm not kidding you he the the values he installed in my sons they are, are part of the reason why the men they are today and my sons are good men my dad was an outstanding grandfather so I you were able of, you were able to bring about an enormous a change huge then, change yes by your own a courage to him. stand up there yeah a change for him a change for her for my mum a change for him in the fact of that he no longer here a change for my kids but I didn't want I didn't I just wanted him to go away but I had to have Christmas with him I remember I, I hated him I hate him and so I had to tolerate him until the day he died and he said to me one day you look at me like I'm dead to you and I said you are you are dead to me he said but how does this work I said it's up to you I don't you can work how you want I'll never forgive you and I never did and I never will do you do you sometimes cry or are you have you shut all that away now? I'm better. So there was a long time I didn't cry. Um, when my mum died, it it was a very complicated process. So obviously, when my my dad and my mum died within eighteen months of each other. So mm. even though my mum died of cancer, she kind of died of a broken heart. She pined for him, and I could never get I, I, whatever. Okay, when she died. Um, I initially cried a lot and then I had to lock that off because she died and six weeks later I found out I was pregnant. It was like a, whoa, it was like a, uh, it was weird. And I, can, I remember saying, don't let it be a girl. It's almost as if I didn't want another female to protect. That's the only way I can imagine it, but it was a girl. And so the grieving process for me, for my me, me and my mum was complicated. I had lost my best friend. She was, I'd lost her. But I'd just been given this like this beautiful daughter. And so it was the happiest and the saddest time of my life. Mm. And I really so, so you did get a girl you had to protect. Yes. Right. <laughs> Not only protect, I got a girl I had to protect from a lot of things, but mainly so she, in my head, so she never turned out like me. And that so, is how I still view it like that. She'll never turn, she'll never. This is like your work never ends. I'm telling you, I don't, she never stops. <laughs> you keep getting a new job, a new set of responsibilities. <laughs> so do I cry? Yeah, yeah, I can. Like, not in a way... I can cry at weird stuff. So my daughter's autistic. So if I watch programmes or hear co- podcasts about children, adults struggling with autism, mm. I can get quite emotional because I can view her future. Yeah. But if if my friend decided that they didn't want to be friends with me... It doesn't touch you. Care, it does not touch me. Adults, adults can't make me cry, no. 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 I couldn't care, even if they die. It's sad, but no. Yeah. So just to bring things to a close, Kendra, because it's been a remarkable talk. Thank you. What, what, what's the one message, if there is one, that you would like to pass on to people? The, the message about children, what, when people see things happening... <clears throat> that they know shouldn't be happening and they're professionals involved in this kind of area of work, what should they do? I think the first thing that anyone should do is ask themselves a question. If you're, you're in a situation, is that good enough for my child? Is what's happening to the child that I'm dealing with? That's what I ask myself every single time. Is that good enough for, for my daughter? Would I, if I die tomorrow, my daughter goes into that household and that's happening. Is that good enough? No. Then, so therefore challenge it. Right? That's, 
the the thing I think that needs to change for in total is is that children are not stupid. They're not. They know what's going on with in whatever level that might be. But they also know that not a lot's going to happen. So why would a child go and disclose at school about DV in the home? They probably already know that not a lot's going to happen because not a lot's going to happen. I don't know how strongly I've got a, you know, mm. well, if there's a DV incident, the, the person isn't made to leave. And how the law works now or how social services work now, if there is a DV incident and it's a man and a woman, the mum is actually held accountable. They're, they're questioning mum and saying, but can you keep these children safe? Very little responsibility is put on the perpetrator. It's brought back to the woman. Can you keep these children safe? Have you got the capability? And that needs to change. That's not acceptable because they've gone through a traumatic experience themselves. So of course the mum is always going to say yes. Would you? Of course they are going to say yes, I can keep my child safe. Okay. I don't want to lose their child. But you actually, we as society aren't giving... Um, the victim a chance to be truthful because the consequences for them could be horrendous you could lose your children if you say i can't keep my child safe because he is actually going to come back later and beat me you can't say that because they'll be like oh and so once again and it's always been this way it's victim blaming the domestic abuse even when somebody's murdered there will be questions around did what was she doing or what was the victim doing to keep themselves safe Mm. And you have this secrecy, don't you? Because the mums have to keep it secret. And also the children know to keep it secret, it seems like. Very few children are willing to say something, particularly if they've learned that professionals aren't going to do anything about it anyway. Why it's would they? More, it's even more harder when it's the other way around. So um, I was working with a case where there was domestic abuse, but I presumed, it was my fault, but I presumed that, what the child was talking about was dad against mum. I just presumed that the whole time because it was a very small child and didn't really verbalise. But actually what happened was mum was getting really drunk and beating up dad. Right. This had been going on for 15 years. And when it sort of come out, this man minim minimised everything and still does. Of course he will, because when we're talking about domestic abuse and we're picturing a woman that I just portrayed being beaten behind the sofa, when it's the other way around and the man's a victim, how much? If a woman is struggling to come and speak about it, what on earth do we think men are going to have even less recognition and support? And and they will be blamed. They'll be like, but you know, what made the woman like that? No, she's a, whoever is the whoever is the um, perpetrator of DV. I was brought up in a DV household. I understand how DV works. I I have never um, displayed domestic abuse. It's not I can control myself. You know, then I know exactly what it looks like. How the power works. So it's a choice. People need to understand this. Domestic abuse is a choice. They're not unwell. It's not because they're drunk. No, 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 no. They're choosing to do that. They're choosing to display that kind of violence and control in the home. That's just my opinion. It might not be true. 